Hi, and welcome to your summit, Your Weight is Over, Postmenopausal Women Scaling Back. And I'm your host, Jean Mitre, weight loss expert. And uh, the intention of this series of conversations is to empower you and offer practical tips in, of information uh, that allows you to lose uh, the weight that you want. Um, to get your vitality back, because uh, you really don't need to be hanging on to that weight any longer. There are, are ways, and the guests that I'm presenting to you have wonderful ways and tips and suggestions for you to get your vitality back and drop those excess pounds. So today, I'm so happy to be talking with Deborah Atkinson, and she is... Hi, Deborah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> she is... Um, her, her brand, we may as well just say that, is Flipping 50. So she's a really great expert for women over 50 and postmenopausal to lose weight. Um, and uh, so she has um, quite a lot of my cat <laughs> credentials here. She is a fitness expert and um, going to find her bio. Why don't you just tell us what, a little bit about your bio, Debra? You know, I think the best way to say it is I've sat on all sides of the tables. And um, I was a personal trainer for a long time. Myself grew into managing many personal trainers. So from that aspect, you know, I virtually had 400 clients at a time by managing my staff who managed that many clients and worked at a university in kinesiology for 15 years. So I lectured to students who were emerging personal trainers at a time when we've never seen more growth in that area. Um, and then, you know, worked for owners and a board who hired me to see the bottom line. So I truly know, you know, what skill set we, as women who are flipping 50, want personal trainers to have what information we are not necessarily always getting. There's a gap. And I think, you know, we're not textbook anymore. The hormones change the game. So the reason for me going into this niche and really focusing only and purely on it is somebody needs to filter all the information into what works for us. Right. And that's my goal. Great. And there's a lot of new research in the last few years right, that are sometimes, again, flipping what we used to know. Completely. Know. Yes. Uh, so much. So much so that we've got a little unlearning to do and relearning new ideas. So many of our listeners, I'm guessing today, will sit and nod logically and intellectually, it makes a lot of sense, but then go stand in front of the yogurt containers and wonder, should I get the full fat, the non-fat or the non-dairy? And You know, it becomes, do I do what's habit gravity is telling me or what I now know is probably the better way. So there's a challenge there. Great. We'll talk about those things for sure. Yeah. And practical information. And um, one thing that really struck me about your bio is that you um, are a contributing editor to the Huffington Post or contributing mm -hmm. article writer. So yep. that's, uh, really great um, uh, for everybody to recognize. Okay, so Deborah, um, let's just start with some questions. Um, what are the biggest mistakes that women make around um, um, the nutritional aspect of weight loss? You know, when it comes to exercise, when people come to me, they're looking usually for, you know, why isn't my exercise working? Because that's always been something that I can fall back on that. If I get busy exercising, it works. But there are three mistakes that women tend to be making and that at midlife, they're amplified. We may always have been making them, but we could get away with a little bit more when we were younger mm -hmm. and we just can't now. So we've got to drive between the navigational lines a little bit better, but they're this number one, not eating enough, mm -hmm. eating the wrong thing or eating at the wrong time, even if it's the right thing. 
all of those things become much more important as we age doing pre or post exercise. So are you going to elaborate on those? Three? I will. <laughs> Which one of those intrigues you the most? Where should we dive in? Um, about the timing. Let's start with that. Okay. So timing is super interesting. And you mentioned, you know, how much research is coming out lately. What we know right now is that post exercise, there's a blunting effect, meaning your body won't do it as well for muscle protein synthesis. So just to clarify, that means the protein that you might be eating, the nutrition you might be eating is not gonna go to the good of your body as well as it should because there are some systems happening that are preventing it from going on until about 60 minutes after you exercise. So I can tell you that I used to be a professional and we used to believe with protein and a little bit carbohydrate in so you'll recover sooner. Would you repeat that? Yeah. Yeah. Internet glitch there. Oh yeah. Uh, we are in the mountains, right? <laughs> so probably within five and 10 years ago, it really came out that if you recall chocolate milk, was getting touted as the post-exercise solution for everything. And those of us who like a little sugar and a little chocolate were in love with that whole idea. But what we've learned is that there's a blunting effect that goes on and it takes about 60 minutes for that blunting effect to be lifted. What so as blunting effect means your body cannot use the protein and nourishment that you give it as well during that first 60 minutes post-exercise. Mm -hmm. So if you wait between an hour and two hours is the sweet spot mm -hmm. for sitting down to a good high quality protein meal, whether it's a smoothie or it's your, your chicken over broccoli. So whatever your choice is, but the point is get that protein in at that specific time. And is there a specific type of protein that you recommend for, for losing weight? Yeah, great question. So high quality protein just leaves the door wide open, doesn't it? So what is that? Right, okay, great question. So there's not one particular kind, and I think we're probably all on the same page, that there's no one diet that's appropriate for every single person. We have this unique biochemistry, we have personal preferences and emotions around food. And you know we have a certain gut health right now that may or may not absorb the same protein as someone else. So that said, what qualifies as high protein for you to choose from would be anything from animal proteins that include fish or shellfish or chicken, beef, bison, elk. I'm loving the wild meats right now, knowing they're probably a little bit less at risk for hormones and antibiotics. And so if they haven't eaten it, we don't have to eat it. Right. But you've got, you know, you want to be looking at, you know, low hormone, you know, grass fed, if you're using beef, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're vegan, same thing applies. It's really about a number. So 20 to 30 grams of protein mm. is one of the best ranges. And that comes from research that started back in 2008, really with uh, University of Texas Medical Branch was some of the first research came out of that. And everything since has really been agreeing with it and pointing to that direction. So as we age, we need that range at every meal. At every meal. That at every meal, yeah. Okay. Okay. So a minimum of three times a day. Now you might have a snack, and it's always wise to include some protein or some fat in a snack so that we're not spiking blood sugar, but that may or may not be the best thing for you. But definitely at those meals, you want to hit it. Now here's a little controversy or a surprise, I think, for people. The older you are and the more sedentary you are, you need to be at the higher end of that range, not the lower. 
the range of what the amount of protein yes the 20 to 30 grams mm -hmm. because an active person someone who is more athletic has better ability to process and synthesize protein right okay that makes sense yep so if i look at my 90 year old mom it's more important for her to be getting that toward 30 grams at each meal than it might be for me who's 53 and extremely active mm -hmm. that's unintuitive for many of us as we age yeah yeah okay all right um so let's see uh what is the calorie myth all about and we talked about that <laughs> yeah. it's it. such a loaded question so if you are here and you're watching your you're 50 and older. We grew up, you know, thinking we were a math equation. Calories in, calories out, and if I create a deficit, I will surely lose weight. What we know now is that hormones control the use of those calories for our bodies. So we know now also in midlife that hormone balance or imbalance is a cause of a lot of problems or the cause for our having fewer issues if we're in balance your goal with exercise and with food intake is hormone balance wow and there have been studies proving that those people who are more in balance and who eat a higher quality of food can eat up to 300 calories more a day and not have any weight gain for it so optimizing our optimizing our body composition our fat to our muscle or lean that's really our goal for most of us and that's where the body sheds weight naturally it wants to let it go it doesn't want to do any more work than it has to <laughs> so if we can operate by that philosophy and create a happy internal environment the weight will much more easily come off so would you say more about the happy internal environment you probably yeah. did talk about it yeah but you real clear about that absolutely and that comes back to hormone balance but also we have to talk to you know gut health so you may be eating you know what you think is quote unquote healthy and yet what we have to ask is well are you absorbing it all you know because of perhaps you're eating some foods that would be on the healthy list mm -hmm. but right now for you may not be healthy your your gut may not be absorbing them you may have what's referred to as leaky gut and we need to eliminate some of those foods first heal and seal you up so that the good food you are putting in goes to the good of your body so that's a part of the healthy environment so do you want us to give us some want to give us some examples of the healthy foods and the non-healthy foods yeah yeah <laughs> yeah good and so this really stems from a lot of work that um, has come out just in the last decade but even five years i think more and more of us are that aware wheat number one dairy um, is another big one and whether it's because of your gut or it's because of an autoimmune problem that you might have those of you who have arthritis you're beginning to notice it may also begin to notice it improves if you remove some of these trigger foods so wheat dairy gluten sugar is probably the biggest one of all you know and some of the others you might remove to test and then reintroduce but sugar most of us probably don't need to reintroduce that or work too hard at doing it we we get plenty of risk the way it is mm -hmm. so other foods that can be you know on that list for people nuts and seeds may bother some people we're digging a little bit deeper here nightshades you have an autoimmune disease for sure so if we're talking Hashimoto's um, or we're talking lupus you know and definitely rheumatoid arthritis um, removing those can be helpful nightshades are tomatoes peppers eggplant yes and you know for those people who are shellfish allergic I mean obviously that is one but those are the biggest culprits right there
So what are some of the best foods for the health of our gut? You know, some of those that I just mentioned might be, <laughs> depending on who you are, but looking at high quality proteins from quality sources, those that we've mentioned, and looking at as many non-starchy vegetables as possible, kind of from three different categories. Our green leafy vegetables, so your spinach, your kale, your chard, your microgreens, and then your cabbage, onions, and mushroom. That's a family all of its own. And then all of those deeply colored things that, you know, as we were talking right now, it's the great, great season for getting fresh vegetables, you know, that maybe you're picking from your own garden. Yeah. But we're talking anything colored deeply through, you know, at that, trying to get a third of your portion of daily vegetables from each of those gives you a much better micronutrient increase than from all of one. So I know a lot of listeners maybe, you know, I eat salads all the time, but I think you want to look outside the box, outside the salad box. Mm -hmm. So if we were to cut out uh, dairy, wheat, and gluten, does mm -hmm. that make our, uh, allow, ourselves to, uh, allow ourselves to be uh, more um, assimil assimilating the nutrients better? Is that part of the uh, concern? It, it may, you're right. And it's, it's really a matter of we eliminate those temporarily and then you reintroduce one by one. Mm -hmm. So you find out, you know, is this something that is a trigger for me? Because when you remove it, give your body a chance to heal if in fact it needs to. And then reintroducing is where you come in with your eyes wide open, you know, was um, eggs we didn't mention, but it falls differently than dairy, but you may reintroduce eggs and realize, okay, I do have an issue with that. It's, I didn't realize I did, but all of us slip into chronic settling and we just assume this is normal. This is our normal. And someone described it. You have glasses on. It makes me think of this. One of my groups, someone described, you know, it's like going in for an eye exam, not knowing you need glasses. And then you suddenly try some on and you're like, this is what I've been missing. You know, so it's missing that feeling really good, you know, that you want to learn, you know, is that happening for me? because it also then ultimately can be a part of weight loss resistance. Yes, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and uh, you know, about the healthy gut, or also known as microbiome, mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the fermented vegetables? You know, I'm in favor. I think it's really a, a great idea, but I think you have to be careful with those too. I mean, like anything else, Producers know now that we're consumers looking for those things, but we may know enough to be dangerous. So I think you've got to be turning things around and really looking at the label. What else is in it? What is in it? What's not in it? You know, and how was it made? How recently was it made? Yes. Really important. Right. For instance, the popular drink, at least where I live here in Colorado, is... <laughs> kombucha and yeah. it's got sugar and yeast in it. So right. it not be that healthy for your, for your gut. I'm so glad you said that and I didn't have to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here we are uh, breaking some myths. Um, as we go along, right? Yeah. So true. So true. And if I can circle back to, let's talk about weight loss. So I'm going to not challenge what you're saying because I do think weight eventually for anybody who's listening and you're here is probably a part of what you want and potentially what you need and you know it, mm -hmm. but also want to, as a fitness professional, address the fact that really you're not wanting weight loss alone. You're wanting fat loss. Yes. We want to be really careful about maintaining the lean muscle we have and potentially even increasing the lean muscle you have, which may slow down what happens on the scale, but in the long run, that's the win for you, is if we can increase that lean muscle tissue, that's what allows us to boost metabolism. And so you're saying the protein you talked about earlier is the primary way of doing that? 
It's, uh, well, certainly I wouldn't say primary above exercise, but, you know, that's just my religion. That's right. <laughs> Deborah's religion. Right. So, but the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So here's what's happening. Since we turned 30, our muscle mass peaks. And on average, but none of us is average, of course, right? We are all above average. Mm -hmm. We lose about a half a pound of lean muscle mass a year, every year. So imagine if you're 50 or you're 60 right now, do math. Mm -hmm. And this is true if you don't do resistance training. Mm -hmm. So you may be uh, very active and say, no, 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 I exercise all the time. But you can't outrun it. You can't bike your way out of it. It truly takes resistance training as a part of your exercise program. So if you've lost 20 years and haven't been weightlifting, the good news is at any time you start, there are studies showing people starting in their 90s mm -hmm. make gains with lean muscle tissue. And that it, very encouraging. Here's the average. We gain about three pounds of lean muscle tissue with a, a good traditional exercise program, strength training. And that's in a month, and we lose four pounds of fat. So if you're doing math now, that's a little bit more my speed, right? So that's not a lot of weight loss on the scale. But here's the disclaimer. Your clothes are going to get loose, right? You're going to have to go shopping. That's just, yeah. <laughs> so if you can handle that, those expected results keep occurring for the 12, first 12 weeks of a program. So by the end of 12 weeks, you've lost 12 pounds of fat, gained nine pounds of lean, but the difference is really probably still going to be in clothes, the way your waistband is fitting well, not cutting in anymore. And the scale will start to change more because now you have more muscle than you have fat, or at least you've lost quite a bit of fat. So don't pay too much attention to the scale, but how you yep. know your clothes are hanging yep. up. You know, I think that's a hard one. I think we're always going to pay attention to the scale. So let's be truthful, but don't just take that scale measurement and record that. Take your measurements at your calf and your thigh and your waist and your chest and your arm. Have a lot of numbers there to give you evidence that you're changing. As well as maybe yeah. some photographs. Photographs and best yet, you know, if you have a bathroom scale, you know, if it doesn't tell you body composition, go and do that. You can walk into any parks and rec facility or a gym and ask them for a body composition test either for free or for probably ten dollars or less yeah. well worth it yep and in fact i incorporate that into my weight loss yeah. because it's so telling after a few weeks fantastic changes in yeah. their little fat their yeah. body and that kind of thing so that's that's really good and by the way before i forget everyone deborah has some wonderful uh youtube videos on um with you know follow along workouts and i'm working on my upper arms right now with um deborah on youtube every day are you measuring <laughs> i think i will be from now on okay, i got <laughs> what most matters most of all to me is how it looks you know right i don't get into measuring a whole lot no. okay anyway. okay so let's go to another question um so um the biggest breakthrough for postmenopausal women regarding nutrition and exercise is what? It's actually adding that protein in. And I can tell you this, that we addressed what happens as far as losing muscle mass if we're not consciously exercising resistance training. There are two other things beside exercise that affects whether we lose or keep our lean muscle mass. And one is adequate calories and deeper adequate protein. Protein is the stuff that muscles are made of. So we need that coming in to build them back up or prevent tearing down mm -hmm. faster than building up happens. And then, you know, the other, the third thing we can't do a thing about is aging. Mm -hmm. So we've got to hit it out of the park, right? With those one and two that we can control. 
because we are going to age and it's just we're controlling do we do it better and that's you know so extremely possible today so for looking at you know what's the biggest impact I always recommend protein because of that fact. It's going to help prevent the loss, build back up. But what I never expected and what women began to tell me more and more is I have so much more energy. Mm-hmm. Yay. Right. Yep. Within a week of just paying attention to nothing more than that's your goal. Let's try to be conscious of how many grams of protein you're getting at each meal and here's your, here's your goal. That simple change makes all the difference. And imagine if you're watching, trying to lose weight, the the old way, most of the time made us tired and less likely to want to move. So when you're really focusing on what to do, what I can eat, what I can have, and it's giving you more energy, you're going to be much more likely to want to move all day not just in the gym but just all day in your life exactly and you know a couple times you mentioned the amount of protein we should have every meal should be 30 grams uh and i think Mm -hmm. a lot of people like me a little while ago i didn't know how much what is that americans how many ounces of that so if you can right yeah absolutely so it's about four to six ounces of almost any animal protein Wow, that makes makes it a little bit easier and if you'll do this you know take your hand and put your knuckles down it's usually kind of up to the first knuckle Mm -hmm. and you know that deck of cards Mm -hmm. that's a good gauge so of course you have thickness that may compromise things or get a little detailed but you know about what that is um four to six ounces is is a great range and that's probably you know in addition to adding a little healthy starch and non-starchy vegetables very filling and very satisfying. You know, more than that is probably too much is going to fill you up. So it's, it's a great place to be. You can also get it. And we haven't mentioned this. So disclaimer, right? I do have a private label. That's not where I'm going with this, but whey protein, plant-based protein powders. So if you're a smoothie girl, you know, and, and, or if you're not, and you're someone who doesn't have time for breakfast, you know, or doesn't have an appetite for breakfast, smoothie for that reason can be a really good way to get that in. We're in the United States, at least it, the only country in the world whose breakfast foods are specific to breakfast and so high in carb traditionally. So if you're not one to flip and have a breakfast or have lunch for breakfast or dinner for breakfast, a smoothie sometimes is just a convenient and easy way to get that protein in and drink it in. Exactly. So, yeah. Get um, it in a dried form where you just yeah. um, hydrate it with water or, coconut mm-hmm. or something like that. You can take it with you, right? But- you can take it with you. Yes. So a lot of people, and I'm a fan of, doing that quickly in a pinch, but really making it a meal by one to two handfuls of spinach or kale, get your berries in, put some fat in. So we've got protein, fat, and fiber that would be no different than sitting down to a plate of good food. And in some ways better and easier to absorb because you've blended it. We've already started the breakdown of those enzymes. So it may actually get into you better. And Typically, I have this happen over and over. Women will say, you know, I wasn't a smoothie girl until I started. <laughs> I love those things, and I couldn't believe they were going to make me full. But, you know, it's, it's not about weight loss or a can of something off of a shelf in the store. We won't throw anybody under the bus. But I think I'll probably all the viewers know who I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, we're really talking about food from your kitchen going into that and blending up good, high-quality food. And tasty too. So you know, yeah, delicious. Yeah, you don't like those those um, leafy green taste at first. Maybe you can put a few drops of stevia in there. Yeah, those, you know that's a healthy yeah. food. That's yep. Sweet because we're used to the sweetness and to help yeah wean you into the the green leafy foods. Completely. So I know that Deborah has a pretty nice gift for us. Do you want to tell us about it, please? Deborah? Absolutely. So if you are exercising, or if you're not. 
It's a quick at a glance checklist. So you know if you're using your precious and limited time to your greatest advantage when you are exercising. It gives you an at a glance shot at what are the highest priorities and what in fact can you leave off and never really need to do that you may have grown up thinking I need to do that. And if you so choose, I've got five short videos. I'll send you one a day proving you can do short bits of exercise and be successful and have it matter. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Who's feeding us? Uh, ah. <laughs> exercise, um, you know, whether we like it or not. Make it <laughs> sure. <laughs> To be easier and faster, right? So true. So true. That's excellent, Deborah. Well, um, we've been talking with Deborah Atkinson, um, fitness expert, and Flipping 50 is her brand. She does that very well, as you can probably tell. She's very good <laughs> at these, all this information that we need. Um, and so uh, be sure and get her free gift. Uh, and also, be sure and um, check your inbox in the morning for uh, more interviews. And um, thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. Uh, we'll be seeing you around Boulder, maybe, because we both live in the Boulder area. Absolutely. We'll have to do coffee. That sounds great. We will. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. For